right, ladies and gentlemen, anything to report from the break? Okay. All right, if the Commonwealth will call its next witness. Yes, Your Honor, it's going to be Sergeant Justin Stilwell. If you'll take a seat, please. And if you'd raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Thank you. Please state your name for the record. Uh, my name is Sergeant Justin Stilwell. And where do you work? Uh, I'm employed with uh, Louisville Metro Police in the robbery unit. Okay. And how long have you been with Louisville Metro Police? Twelve years. Twelve years. And have you been assigned to any other units during your time there? Uh, yes, I've been assigned to the uh, hostage negotiation team, uh, dignitary protection team, and the poor sp uh, peer support team. Okay. And back in uh, March of 2020, which unit were you assigned? Uh, peer support. And just so that we have a better idea, what does peer support mean within the department? Uh, peer support is a special team that's designed to help officers when they're involved in uh, traumatic events help them uh, get through stressful events. Uh, we're a support unit for officers on the department. And do you all receive special training to become part of that unit? We do. What type of training? Uh, we take a course through the uh, KCCRB for uh, stress management and dealing with uh, critical and traumatic events. Okay. And back on March 12th into the morning hours of March 13th of 2020, were you working uh, or were you in uh, PIU and working that evening? I was. Okay, sorry, PSU. Working as PSU, what did you do that evening? Uh, with the uh, peer support team? Yes. Um, I was notified through our dispatch. Um, I got a page on my phone, as we do with uh, critical incidents, that there had been an officer involved shooting in the uh, third division and that there had been an officer struck. And so I uh, sent uh, part of my team to the scene uh, to support the officers there. And then myself and our uh, police counselor, Dr. Ville, went to the hospital to uh, support uh, Sergeant Mattingly. Okay. And you said third division. Does that encompass 3003 Springfield Drive? It does. And is that where the incident you spoke of occurred? Yes. Okay. So you said you went to the hospital. What do you do when you go to the hospital? Uh, so my main job there is to um, touch base with the officers that are involved and uh, make sure that they get the support that they need, whether that would be uh, contacting family members to let them know that they're okay, or if, uh, if they need anything. Uh, basically, I'm just there for support for those involved officers. Okay. Now, when you say officers involved, are you meaning uh, anyone in the scene, or what, can you just describe what you mean by involved? So, uh, it differs. Uh, I would put them in two different tiers. There's um, officers that were involved, present, or actually active in the event. And then there could be like a secondary tier of officers who arrived later. Uh, maybe they rendered aid or set a perimeter. So uh, our primary focus is our officers that were involved in that critical traumatic event. And then if uh, the secondary tier, people who showed up later or did secondary things, if they need support, then we would reach out to them. But our primary focus are the officers that were involved in the event. Okay. and. Does that encompass officers that are witnesses or shooters, or what's the difference? Yes. Um, so if uh, an officer is a shooter in a critical incident, uh, they're considered uh, to be involved, and we would want to uh, provide them support and an escort. If they are a witness, then uh, we do want to provide them some support, but they're usually allowed to transport themselves to uh, PIU, which our public integrity unit, which would be the next step. Okay. What do you mean by, you said the term escort. What do you mean by escort in this sense? So an escort, um, the role that we play is uh, you basically tag along with that involved officer, one, to make sure that they're okay. 
Uh, anytime someone goes through a critical incident, it's very stressful. People handle it differently, so their normal coping mechanisms may not be able to handle that stress. Some people do great, some people don't. It just depends on the individual. So we keep an eye on that officer to make sure they're okay. Um, like I said before, to alert their family um, so that the families or friends or loved ones don't find out on the news so they can touch base with the ones that they care about. And uh, we give them a basic knowledge of the investigative process, like what we're going to do further uh, in the evening uh, once we arrive to PIU. And as a peer support officer, what is the role when you're actually interacting or um, accounting for an officer who has actually been a shooter in the case? Um, normally we would uh, we separate the involved officers. So uh, if you have an involved officer, they'll have an escort. If you have a second involved officer, they'll have there'll be a second escort. And so they will be separated. We try to kind of distance them from the scene to uh, shield them from any news media, to uh, kind of have a private setting so that um, they can kind of process the, uh, the event, talk to their loved ones, and not have to deal with the media uh, right away. Are, are they allowed to drive anywhere or do they have to go straight to PIU? So uh, if you're a shooter at um, a critical incident, then you are to have an escort uh, transport you. Uh, there are, there have been uh, some instances where the officer would drive themselves and then that escort would follow them but the, uh, the connection between the officer and the escort should be kind of hand in hand through this event. Okay. And is that policy any different if you are a canine handler with an active dog in the vehicle? Um, not, not to my knowledge. However, there are some things to consider with canines. Um, if an officer has a canine, um, I would want to, one, check on the officer and know their mental state to see if they were okay to operate their vehicle. Uh, if I myself were to get into a canine vehicle with a canine dog, even though I'm a sworn police officer, that may not be a good situation because that dog may not know me, may see me as a threat. So if uh, dealing with a canine officer, I would either check on his, his or her status to make sure they're okay so that I could follow them in my car on, in route to VIU, or I would contact the lieutenant of the canine unit to uh, have them set up another handler to come get that truck and that dog so that uh, we could keep all, all the officers on scene safe so that dog didn't consider anyone they're not familiar with a threat. So an escort still remains even if it's a canine? Yes. Okay. So on this night, you said you went to U of L for the emergency room? I did. Okay. When you arrived, who was there? Uh, when I got there, um, I touched base with uh, Sergeant Mattingly. Uh, his wife later showed up, followed by um, some of the colonels and uh, Chief Conrad. Uh, Doc Treville uh, met me there. He's our uh, police counselor that works hand in hand with peer support. Okay. And did you see anyone else there that evening? Uh, there were some officers from other units, but um, no one from the uh, the group that was at uh, the, the incident address. Okay. At some point, do you see Detective Brent Hankinson arrive at the U of L hospital? I did. Did that stand out to you? Uh, yes. Why? Uh, I was actually on my way um, from leaving the hospital. I touched base with Sergeant Mattingly and, and his wife and made sure that they had what they needed. And as I was uh, exiting the main ER, ER doors to go into like the lobby of the ER, uh, Detective Hankinson came through. Um, we had a brief conversation uh, as we passed. Okay. At that point, did you know that he had been involved in the case? Yes. At that point, did you know that he was a officer who had discharged their firearm in the case? No. Okay. Following up after that with the families, what did you do next? Um, after I spoke to Detective Hankinson, I left uh, um, L and went to our public integrity unit and touched base with my team and the officers that were there. Okay. Was Detective Hankinson there by that time? No. Do you know approximately how much later it was that he arrived? Uh, it was after me. I'm not sure uh, the, the time frame, um, but I do know it wasn't uh, the time it would take you to get from UL. There was a delay, okay. uh, but I cannot remember the specific increments of it. When you were at UofL, you said that you briefly spoke to him? I did. What did you say? Um, I, I talked to him, and I told him that, uh, or I asked him, I said, where, where are you going? And he said, I'm going to see John, uh, Sergeant Mattingly. And I said, okay, you need to get to PIU. And he said, 
uh, I've already talked to Kim. And I said, okay, and we went our different directions. Okay. But in your mind, he needed to report? Yes. Um, when you're involved in a critical incident uh, from the scene, you sh your next stop from the scene should be PIU. Did he appear to have any type of escort at that time? I think that's all the questions I have for you. Thank you very much, Sergeant Silwell. Cross-examination. Thank you, Your Honor. Sergeant, just so I understand your testimony correctly, you responded when you learned of this incident to U of L Hospital, correct? Correct. Did you ever go up to 3003 Springfield? No, sir. I was never there. Did some of your uh, Are you in charge of the peer support? Uh, my unit? role uh, My role during that time was the assistant team commander, and the team commander was out of town on vacation, so I was uh, acting commander of the team at that time. And did you call other team members and direct them to go to Springfield? I did. And. But you never went to Springfield yourself, correct? That's correct. Do you know whether Brett Hankison was ever assigned a peer support officer while he was on the scene at uh, Springfield? That I don't. So the first time you saw him was when he showed up at U of L Hospital, yes. correct? Yes. And he did not have a peer support officer with him at that time? No. Did you assign one to him then? I did not. I wasn't aware of whether he had an uh, uh, peer support escort at that time or not. Uh, it wasn't until I later got to PIU that I was made aware that he did not have an escort. Did you find it unusual that he came to U of L to check on his friend and partner John Mattingly? As unusual through the, the policy, yes. But again, the policy is that somebody is supposed to assign a peer support officer right there on the scene, is that correct? Yes, sir. And to your knowledge, that wasn't done? Correct. Was it done for anybody that was there involved? Uh, yes. Who? The uh, other two officers, uh, Officer Franklin and Officer Connor, were both escorts uh, for officers on the scene. And were there more than those two peer support officers there? Uh, yes, Sergeant Nagel, uh, who's a squad leader, was there as well. Okay. But to your knowledge, nobody was assigned to Brett Hankison, correct? Correct. Thank you. Nothing further. Sergeant Stillwell, are officers aware of the policies when it comes to being involved in a critical incident and what they're to do with peer support? Uh, yes. And did Miles Cosgrove, Detective Miles Cosgrove on that evening, another involved officer, did he have peer support? Yes. No further questions. May I, Sure. Sergeant, do you know whether Brett Hankison was aware of that specific policy? Um, I haven't spoke to him directly about that. However, our policies are disseminated through our email, and you have to check off on them within 10 days every time that they're submitted. So he's required to submit and uh, view the policy uh, once, it came, once it comes out, and that, that has been a standing policy for uh, a good while. Did you direct him when you saw him at U of L Hospital to go to PIU? No. I, I, I spoke to him, and I said, you need to go to PIU, and he spoke. He said to me that he'd already talked to Kim, who was his major uh, in his unit. And he did respond to PIU, is that correct? He did. Thank you. Nothing further. After you left U of L, you get to PIU. Is Detective Hankinson there at that time? He's not. I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else, Mr. Matthews? No, Your Honor. All right, you can step down. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. All right, the Commonwealth's next witness. Yes, Your Honor. It's going to be former Chief Steve Conrad.
you go ahead and take a seat. And if you'll raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Thank you. You can take your mask off while you're testifying if you wish, but you don't, you're not required to. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. Please state your name for the record. My name is Steve Conrad. And uh, where do you work currently? I, I am retired now, so I don't work. Okay. And where did you used to work? Uh, I was uh, up until June 1st of 2020, the Louisville Metro Police Chief. And how long were you with the Louisville Metro Police Department in your career? I started uh, in 1980 uh, and, and uh, retired from the department uh, in, in 2012. Uh, and I left uh, and went to, uh, I'm sorry, in, in 2025, or in 2005, and went to the city of Glendale, Arizona uh, to take the job there as the police chief. Uh, I worked uh, there as a police chief for six years and then had an opportunity to come back to be the police chief here in Louisville in 2012. Uh, I was in that position from 2012 to June of 2020. Uh, so all total, that would have been 34 years as a uh, a police officer of, of, from the rank of a, a police recruit up to a police chief. And back in March uh, of 2020, March 12th into the early morning hours, March 13th, were you serving as the chief of LMPD at that time? Yes, sir, I was. Okay. And on that day, were you notified that there had been a critical incident somewhere in the city? Uh, actually, uh, I was notified about uh, 1 in the morning on, on March 13th. Okay. Can you just go through the notification process of how you became aware of what occurred on March 13th of 2020? Uh, yes. Uh, again, at about uh, 1 in the morning, uh, I started uh, receiving phone calls and text messages from a number of different members of the department, uh, making me aware of an officer-involved shooting. And when you were notified, um, what briefly, what do you do when that happens? Typically, uh, it, it depends on the situation. Um, in, in this situation, um, an officer had, had been shot. Um, that prompted me to uh, respond to the hospital uh, once I'd gathered uh, the initial information from the people who were calling and texting me. Um, in situations where um, an officer has not been shot, um, in those situations I will typically respond to the scene of the shooting uh, get a sense of what's occurred and give preliminary statements to the media. I, I didn't do that in this situation. Okay. Did you, in this case then, did you go straight to the, the U of L hospital versus the scene? Uh, yes, that is correct. Who was there when you arrived? There were many people uh, in the emergency room uh, when I arrived. Uh, there were, um, I, I would guess, maybe 10 or 15 police employees. Um, there were, uh, Sergeant uh, John Mattingly uh, had been shot, uh, his parents were there, um, his wife uh, was there, uh, there may have been another family member, I believe it was his sister who was there, um, and beyond that obviously the, the hospital staff. Okay. In the information that you received, did you know how many officers had been involved? I received uh, different information over the, the course of the, the, that early morning. Uh, initially, uh, the information that I was given uh, was uh, that, that there were two officers involved uh, in the shooting. Um, later, um, I, I learned that there was a third officer that was involved in that shooting as well. When you were at U of L, did you see any of those involved officers at any time? The only officer. Uh, involved in the shootings that I saw at the hospital was Detective Brent Hankinson. And why did that stand out to you, if it did at all? It, it, it did. Um, in, in my experience during my time as the chief at the department, when we've had officer-involved shootings um, and, and where an, an officer is injured, it is not unusual for friends and colleagues of that injured officer to come to the hospital. To, uh, to see what is happening uh, and see what the condition of the officer is. Uh, but in an officer-involved shooting, uh, typically uh, those officers are assigned uh, someone from peer support 
which is a volunteer team of officers that we have that have uh, training and counseling. They're led by a, a, um, a doctor who uh, also has a degree in, in psychology. Uh, and the peer support officers will essentially, there'll be one assigned to each officer involved. Uh, and, and their job is, is essentially to get them um, the support that they're needing, uh, making sure they're getting something to eat, making sure they have uh, something to drink, uh, making sure they're making contact with their families, uh, and, and doing that sort of thing. Uh, they also accompany them to the Public Integrity Office, uh, where uh, the Public Integrity Office collects uh, evidence from the shooting uh, that might be um, evidence such as, as um, fingerprint swabs, um, or, or uh, counting the number of rounds in their weapons, depending on which, which weapons they had fired. And so, to, to your point, sir, um, it, it was unusual when I saw Detective Hankinson. Uh, he came into the emergency room. He was not being escorted by a member of uh, the peer support team, which, which I thought was unusual. Did you see any other officers that had been involved in this in that capacity at the hospital? I did not. What was the demeanor of Detective Hankinson when you saw him at the hospital? When I saw him at the hospital, um, he, he walked in and, and he went into the, the room where Sergeant Maddenley and his wife uh, were at, I assume to check on him. Um, at, at that point, there was really no ability for me to assess his demeanor. Um, after he came out of that room, uh, he was standing out in the emergency room, but, but out of the actual physical room where Sergeant Mattingly was. Um, I saw him standing there. Uh, I approached him at that point uh, and, and had a brief conversation with him. Um, during that conversation, uh, I, I noticed uh, that uh, Detective Hankinson was um, physically shaking um, as, as if he was um, upset or, or um, very, very nervous. Okay. Now, you said uh, that the policy was that he should have reported to PIU, is that correct? The, the process, as, as opposed to a policy, um, would, have, would have been that he would have been assigned someone um, by peer support, and peer support would have essentially shepherded him, shepherded him uh, to, to public integrity so that evidence could be collected and, and then again make sure that he got home safely. In your experience with LNPD, especially as the chief uh, over those years that you were there in leadership roles, how many officer-involved shootings do you think you responded to at U of L? Honestly, I, I don't know. Okay. Uh, there, there were. I would guess during my time as chief, there were likely 50 officer-involved shootings. Um, the number of times that officers were injured were were significantly fewer uh, than, than, than suspects that officers ended up having to shoot um, three or four times. And that's just a guess. I honestly don't know. In any other occasion when you've responded to U of L and in, in, where an officer has been uh, shot in the line of duty and there's been other officers discharged their firearms, have you ever seen another officer who has discharged, not injured, ever report to the U of L ER before going to PIU? Not that I'm aware of. It could have occurred, but, but not that I'm aware of. Thank you very much, Chief Conrad. I think that's all the questions I have. Yes, sir. Cross-examination. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon, Chief. Good afternoon, sir. With reference to what you just testified to, that it's the policy is to go to PIU from the scene of an officer-involved shooting for an officer that's involved in that shooting, correct? And again, I, I believe it's, it's a practice as opposed to a policy, but yes, sir. A policy I, is a, a rule that it, you're, you're ordered to follow, correct? It, it, is, it is a, um, a policy 
or a procedure that directs your actions during some sort of activity, and if you deviate from that policy or practice uh, and, and are, are questioned about it, you have to um, be in a position to explain why you may have deviated. So that reporting to PIU for an officer who's involved in discharging his weapon in an officer-involved shooting is a practice rather than a policy, correct? Again, I would refer to it as, as one of the, the um, procedures that would have been followed by our public integrity unit, uh, and, and they have the responsibility for interviewing witnesses, collecting evidence, and, and making sure that they are able to um, fully investigate an officer-involved shooting. And that would involve um, collecting evidence from the involved, from the, from the officers that were involved in the shooting. And the who assigns a peer support officer to an officer who's involved in a shooting? That is typically done um, by the supervisor of the peer support team. Uh, that could be a, a lieutenant who actually leads the team, or it could be one of the sergeants who acts as, as a assistant a supervisor in that. And, I, and to answer your question, I, I don't know. But it, it's not up to the officer who's involved in the shooting to go out and grab somebody and ask them to be his peer support officer, correct? That is correct, sir. Okay. Um, are you aware of the relationship between Brett Hankison and John Mattingly? I, I am not, sir. I know that they've worked together for, for many years. I, I assume they're friends. Beyond that, I, I don't know. Okay. And you testified that it's not unusual for friends and relatives to show up at the emergency room when an officer is, is injured in the line of duty, correct? That is correct. Did you find it unusual that Brett Hankison would show up at UofL emergency room to check on his friend John Mattingly that early that morning? The only thing that I found unusual about it was he was not escorted by someone from the peer support team. And you don't know whether he'd been assigned peer support officer or not at that point, correct? That is correct. Okay. Um, and did you later learn that he did go to PIU? I know that he went to PIU. I don't know at what point. I don't remember at what point I learned that. Do you know whether it made any difference in the investigation that occurred? I, I do not, sir. And I think you testified that when you observed him after he came out of Sergeant Mattingly's room in the emergency department, that uh, Brett was visibly shaking? Yes, that is correct. He's upset by the situation, correct? I assume so, sir. I don't know. For some reason, he was visibly shaking, correct? Yes, sir. Thank you. I have nothing further. Anything else of this witness? Describing his demeanor a minute ago, you, descri you described it as upset, nervous, or upset or nervous. Is there a difference in your mind between what upset means or nervous means? I don't know that there is. Uh, again, I, I saw him visibly shaking. Beyond that, I'm, I'm not sure what would have caused that other than being upset or, or being nervous. And I, and I don't know that I could tell you which caused him to, to be shaken. Okay. That's it. Thank you. Nothing further. You can step down. Thank you. Thank you. And your next witness? Officer Chris Kitchen. If you'll take a seat, please. All right, if you'll raise your right hand. 
Do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Please state your name for the record. Officer Christopher Kitchen. And uh, where do you work? Louisville Metro SWAT team. And how long have you been with Louisville Metro? 17 years. Okay. And how long have you been with the SWAT team? Um, 15. Okay. And did you receive special training to become a member of SWAT? Yes, sir. What type of training did you receive? Um, I've gone through, well, initially SWAT school. Um, I've also been through sniper schools um, and continuous training. Specialized training beyond a patrol officer? Yes. Okay. And back in March, uh, particularly March 12th into March 13th of 2020, were you working with SWAT at LMPD? Yes, I was. Okay. On that evening, what was your assignment? Um, I was assigned to the warrants that were being served on Elliott Street. Okay. And did you ever go to Elliott Street? Yes. Okay. Can you just describe that for us briefly? Um, so my role that night on Elliott Street was I was, we had three different locations that we were hitting um, and we were going to do them one at a time. Um, so my initial role was to hold cover on two of the um, locations while we, while an entry team on one location cleared that location and then we'd move to the next one. And then I would lead the team clearing the third location to the final house that we were going to clear. And what does cover mean? Um, I'm holding down with my rifle, making sure that no one comes out of the house that's going to do us harm or, or my team harm. Okay. Um, are you able to finish that mission or does something happen? Um, we were actually in the uh, process of um, taking someone into custody that had come out of the second location while the team was in the first location when across our headsets, which is connected to our radios, um, we get the call, um, shots fired, officer down. Okay. Um, which turned everything into chaos and confusion. Okay. At that scene? At that scene. Okay. What do you all do? Um, at the time, we were trying to figure out, like, was this bleed over from another channel or what? And then Sergeant Fawn, who was also in CID and in SWAT, was able to confirm that at another location that CID was doing a warrant that there was an officer shot. Um, myself and other officers loaded into our armored Bearcat and proceeded across town to that location. Is a Bearcat basically a armored vehicle? It's a very large armored vehicle, okay. yes. Okay. Um, so you switch locations. How long does it take to switch locations? It was a good, because where we were coming from downtown to there was a good 15 minute drive at least. Okay, so 15 minutes. Where do you arrive when you all get there? Um, when we get there, um, we pull up into the parking lot and are getting cars to move so that we can pull directly in front of the apartment. Do you remember what the address of that apartment was? I do not. Okay. Would, if I said 3003 Springfield, would that be consistent? It sounds familiar. Um, at the time, we were just being told that it's, um, initially on scene, we were told it was an upstairs apartment. And then as we pulled closer, we, we were redirected that it was a downstairs apartment on the right that was already lit up by lights. Okay. What was your viewpoint at this point when you arrived? Um, I took a position in what's called the turret of the Bearcat. It's an upward um, open hatch that's armor plated also. Um, I took the position as cover from up there um, so as the rest of my team would make the approach to initially throw in what's a throw bot we have a small robot that we can throw in and drive around um, to initially clear the location we were still working under the impression that there was a shooter inside um, so I was covering their approach um, giving basically taking patrol and everyone out of, of it taking having them take their guns and put them away or what we call check up and I would have primary shot if something did happen to cover my team. So you, that night you never go into the apartment? Um, I made it to the, just inside the front door. Um, once the team cleared initially with the robot, we go in to do a methodical clear, um, just looking for people. Um, and as they pushed into the apartment, I no longer had a, no longer could cover them because they're inside, I'd just be pointing my gun at them, which is no, no. Um, so I checked up, climbed out of the turret, told my lieutenant I'm pushing up um, to assist, and I pushed up to the back of this, what we call the stick, the line of officers, and got there. And as they continued working deep into the apartment, I would move in. It's kind of just kind of bounding in, um, and I made it 
if you go into the left, kind of goes into like a, a kitchenette area. I made it just into there where I could see down the hallway. Okay. What do you, where do you go next after that? Um, I exit there and I go back to the Bearcat um, and where I turn my video off because at the time that we were done, I just I turned it off. Um, and then I reconvened at the, at the sidewalk with the rest of the SWAT officers. At that sidewalk, did you notice anything about the scene? Um, we just had a conversation about like the neighbors and where the bullets inside had possibly gone and no one knew if there had been a welfare check done at a neighboring apartment. And so I volunteered um, and then a Sergeant Burns um, volunteered to go with me to walk to the other apartment just to make sure everyone in that apartment was not bleeding. Everybody was good. Nobody had been hit by anything. Um, and that's, that's when we journeyed down the, down the sidewalk. When you walk on the sidewalk, do you notice anything? Um, as we walk down the sidewalk, um, we had previously noticed the shattered um, sliding glass doors. I noticed that from the turret. But as we walked down the sidewalk, that's when Sergeant Burns and I observed the bedroom window that had been shot out. Um, I actually looked at Sergeant Burns at night and said, hey, do you think this was from tonight or do you think this is old? Okay. I'm going to show you what has already been admitted as Commonwealth's Exhibit 31. Have you take a look at that. Is that a fair and accurate depiction of uh, what you just described as sliding glass doors and a bedroom window? Yes. And that evening, where are you in proximity to this picture? Um, so in proximity to this picture, where the s steps are um, that leads back into the, the breezeway or common area, um, we had gathered right there after we'd cleared. There's a laser pointer up there yep. if you need it. Thank you. Um, we gathered right in this area, and then Sergeant Burns and I walked this area when we observed the, the windows of the bedroom that had been shot out. Did you have third. any thoughts or pers anything related to those? Other than the, the blinds were closed and asking Sergeant Burns, do you think this was from tonight or do you think this is old? Could you see in either of the windows or the sliding glass doors? No. Okay. When you were walking, did you see anyone else at all interact with you on that sidewalk? As we turned from the window and continued to the neighbor's apartment, off into the parking lot, I observed um, Detective Hankison um, alone, um, and he was pointing at himself, and he pointed at the windows. And in my opinion, he was taking credit and ownership of that. What was his demeanor? Um, he was kind of bouncing um, as he did it. Um, again, at the time, I took his as ownership, and hey, that's what I did right there. Um, and then Barnes and I then turned and knocked on the door and did our welfare check. Okay. Did you see him at all any other times that Not, evening? I saw him out of the corner of my eye when I exited the apartment initially on the initial clear as I was making my way to the um, Bearcat. Um, he was in the parking lot making his way towards the front of the, the building where he went after that. I had no clue. I wasn't looking for him. I wasn't paying attention for him. Okay. Um, at the time, I didn't even know that he had been involved in the shooting. Okay. And after all this, at some point, do you return to the SWAT vehicle? Yes. And did you have any further involvement after that? No. We... Once we were done and it was turned over to detectives, we um, left and went back to SWAT headquarters. Okay. I think those are all the questions I have for you, Officer Kitchen. Thank you very much. I promise, sir. Cross examination. Officer Kitchen, do you know who put out the radio broadcast about an officer being shot on Springfield while you were on Elliott? At the time, no. Now, Yes. Who put that out? Detective Hankson. Okay. Um, and you just indicated where you were walking when you saw Detective Hankison on the sidewalk. What apartment were you checking on? Um, do you know? So I do not know the apartment number, but it was, if, the picture's not there. If, if, if you're looking at that picture, here's, you're facing the building. There, it's back up okay. there now. So this would have been her apartment. Yes. There's an apartment that literally, if you walk straight down the sidewalk, that mirrors it. They share a common wall, um, and we were going there 
once again, make sure people were okay. Okay, it, it was not a welfare been, check. I'm sorry, it would not have been an apartment. Not related to where the rounds from that window and the assigned glass door went, no. Um, but there was lots of shell casings at the front door. We know rounds went that way. Um, and that was our conversation of, has anyone checked on this apartment? Because that was our first obvious sign. This was, you know, we're not there as detectives. We're not trying to um, do round trajectory. It was just obvious to us and we wanted to do a welfare check immediately so, so we could render aid if need be. And you found no need for aid in that apartment you checked? Correct. Out, correct. And when you saw Officer Hankison, you said he pointed to his chest? Yes, he pointed at himself and then he pointed at the windows as if he's taking credit. Like, that's what I did. He's admitting that he fired through yes. those windows. That's how you took it. It's how I, in my opinion, how I took it. Um, but there was no words exchanged from us. Thank you. I have nothing for Anything else of this witness? That's all up, Your Honor. You can step down. Thank you. Thank you. Your next witness. Sergeant Brandon Hogan. If you'll take a seat, please. And if you'll raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yes, ma'am. You may take your mask off while you're testifying if you wish. You're not required to. State your name, please. It is Sergeant Brandon Hogan. And where are you employed? Louisville Metro Police Department. How long have you been with the department? 13 years. And what is, in, in what division are you? Right now I'm currently assigned to the firearms training unit. Prior to your assignment there, where were you assigned? Uh, Louisville Metro Police Department SWAT team on the full-time team. The full-time SWAT team? Yes, ma'am. How long were you with SWAT? A total of nine and a half years. Um, I was five years or five and a half, around five, five and a half full-time, and then before that we were part-time. And I was about four years part-time before that. And what does the SWAT team, what are they responsible for? What is their basic function? Uh, well, they have many functions, but their main function um, is serving high-risk warrants, barricaded subjects, hostage rescue, active shooters, stuff like that. Uh, and this group require uh, special training to be in the SWAT unit? Yes, ma'am, it does. And you went through that training? Yes, ma'am. Now, in March, on March 13, March 12, uh, 2020, you were a member of SWAT team? Yes. Uh, full time? Yes. And were you involved in the serving of the search warrants uh, that evening at the Elliott Avenue locations yes I was and at some point during the service uh, were you actually assigned to a specific address on Elliot or were what was your no I was not um, assigned to a specific address my function on the Elliot Avenue warrants um, there was a it was we had houses to, to uh, serve warrants on both sides of the street so I was containment, which means uh, I hold the outer perimeter until the entry guys get done clearing the houses. Um, I ran the two, the team that was in control of the two armored vehicles we have, the bear and the bearcat. So they're in the middle of the street protecting the entry team guys working on the south side of the street first, and they, they're going to cross the street and go to the north side and 
um, clear a vacant building there that was on a search warrant. So I was basically providing security for the entry team on the outside. At some point that evening, did you hear that there was a problem on Springfield Drive? Yes, I did. And uh, had, had you, did that come to your attention? Uh, through our headsets, we are there, which are attached to our radios. Um, on body cam, you can't hear it because it is in my headset. But I was alerted by Sergeant Luke Fawn, who is also on CID, but he was on SWAT at that time as well. Uh, I believe he was cont on containment as well in the back of one, of the, in the rear of one of um, Elliott Ad Avenue's addresses. And he alerted me through my headset or on the radio that um, there was an officer shot at a location which turned out to be Springfield. Um, and they had a person who was barricaded in that location that had shot an officer. And did you, at that point, travel to Springfield in the Bearcat? At that point, um, I sort of got a little bit more confirmation. But yeah, I gathered, uh, I think it was five or six uh, SWAT guys. And we jumped into the Bearcat, left the bear there in the middle of the street on Elliott, so they could still provide cover, some kind of cover to the entry team working on Elliott Street. And we decided to go code three lights and sirens, emergency equipment to uh, Springfield from Elliott. And what happened when you got to Springfield? We rolled up to Springfield. We were first, um, we had two officers. Uh, Sergeant Joe Cassie came in his own vehicle with I think it was one or two other SWAT members. So we first stopped um, for them to catch up to us. So when they caught up to us, we were stopped by a, uh, I guess it, it, had, it was pretty tall, maybe eight foot chain link fence that was chained with a padlock on it. So we couldn't get the Bearcat through that. Um, um, Lieutenant Massey made the decision for us to run through the, the gate so we can get up to the location quicker, which we did. Right before we pulled up, to the front of the apartment um, in the parking lot, I met with Lieutenant uh, Sean Hoover, and he advised me that they had a shooter inside who was supposed to have a, a rifle of some sort, um, and one officer had been shot. Uh, right before we rolled up on the radio, uh, we also heard that the male suspect had, or subject, or suspect at that time, had come out of the location already. So before we even pulled out, uh, I believe it was Mr. Walker, he came out. He stated that, and I heard this from um, the radio and Lieutenant Hoover as well, that uh, there was no rifle inside, that his girlfriend was down inside and she was the one that was shooting. It was a nine millimeter handgun. There was no rifle. Um, but when you approached then, he had already been he had already come out of the building yes, that is walking. and taken into custody. So yeah. he was not there when you actually arrived on scene. He was there when he we was were, in a vehicle. When we actually arrived on scene, he was still in the apartment. When we stopped to talk to Lieutenant Hoover, he had come out and he'd been put into a vehicle. So prior to our approach and actually stopping in front and starting to do um, our job, you know, trying to clear the building, he had already been out of that, out of the apartment, yes. So then you uh, approach the building. Yes. Now, as you approached, um, did you notice the sliding glass doors? Yes. And were you able to see through those? No, I was not. Why is that? Um, there are some type of blinds and drapes um, blocking my view. I couldn't see in from the outside. And did you notice that the bullet holes or shattered glass in the sliding doors? Yes, there was a shattered glass on the ground and it looked like maybe uh, half the door on the glass that creates the door had been sort of shattered and fallen off. And there were a couple bullet holes in the sliding glass door and the uh, window directly to the right of that door. And were you able to see into the window? No. Was there much light around? There was parking lot lamps, um, and there was some, I guess, lights from vehicles, but it was it was pretty dark outside. So you could not see into the rooms on the other side of the 
sliding doors or the window. Now, um, how did you all make entry into the apartment? So, um, well, when we pulled up originally, um, Officer Kitchen, he took the high cover, which means he popped out of our turret, which is on top of the roof of the Bearcat, and he provided high cover down into the apartment. While we approached from, I guess, for all intents and purposes, the left side of the apartment, um, our first initial plan was to throw what we call Ricky. Um, it's basically a little bitty robot. We call them throwbots because you can throw them right, throw them like, and throw them and drive them like a, drive them like a, uh, a remote control car. It's very easy. And the reason we do that is so we can, if there's somebody else in there who is a shooter, we can see um, what's in there and who is in there. It just makes it safer before we go in there and send a dog or a person in there. Um, that was our initial plan. We got up to, I held the corner right by the sliding glass door with Mark Crawford or Officer Crawford as the other part of the answer team went behind me to the front door of the apartment. They actually did deploy the robot inside um, and then they advised me, Sergeant Cassidy advised me that they saw who later was Brianna Taylor um, down at the end of the hallway. He asked me if we wanted to take it, which means did he want me, at that point I was sort of like the entry team leader because I was in the back, he was in the front doing the work and I was sort of just directing traffic um, or directing people, guys where to go. And I told him, I can't see what you see, so if you wanna take it, take it. So we decided basically for the safety of her, not knowing if she was a shooter um, or if she had shot um, and if she was still alive and needed medical attention that we probably need to get in there instead of riding a rollout around, we need to get in there and search and get to her as quickly as possible. Oh, is that what you did? That is what we did. We entered, um, after we threw the robot in, Cassie entered, Sergeant Cassie entered the, the front door, and then I came in about fourth or fifth behind some other people. And you, so the whole team made entry? Yes. And did you clear the rooms? We well, cleared the rooms. First, let me ask you, did you determine the status of Ms. Taylor at the end of the hallway? We did not do that until um, we had cleared the residence. And the reason we did that was we had to clear the residence of any threats first, or if there was anybody else that was going to shoot us, we had to clear any, any threats out of that residence first. And then we would get to her as, as quickly as, as we could and check her medical status. And so did, do you all have a medic with you? or We do. We have um, Louisville Metro EMS personnel who are also paramedics, and they are um, attached to our SWAT team. It's totally voluntary for them. And, but they get all the same gear and equipment that we do, and they are usually there on every warrant that we do or barricade subject in case an officer gets shot, that's, they help us out, or they can help somebody else that's been shot. And so did the medic determine the status of Ms. Taylor? So we cleared the residence first, and then um, we called for the medic. The medic came into the location, came to her, we couldn't, first we couldn't find a pulse, and then we, then we had the medic come up, um, and he determined that she was, we say 1080, which means deceased. So your purpose was to clear each room to make sure there wasn't any, and then to look for, uh, because at, in a photograph, that we have seen earlier uh, in the south bedroom, a nine millimeter gun was found under the bed. Yes. And I believe Sergeant Cassie. I never personally saw the pistol. Um, <clears throat> I didn't see any firearms in there, but I wasn't looking for firearms either. I was looking for people and if people were injured. Okay. While you were in the apartment, did the defendant, Hankison, come to the front door? Yes, ma'am. And where were you? Were you up there by the door? I was close to, I was in and out or close to the threshold, yes. And were you aware at that time that he had discharged his pistol during the shooting? No, I wasn't aware of any police officers in specifically who had discharged their firearms. 
should a person, a, a officer who has shot, discharged his gun, come back into the scene? Typically, that's not um, protocol, but like if we, when we do warrants, um, we usually turn it over to the detectives on scene. So yeah, they will come up and talk to us and say, hey, is the scene clear and that kind of thing. Um, I've only been in one other police involved shooting and it was totally different than that. So it's not typical. No, it's not typical for that to happen, but it never, it probably, it's, it's not to say it doesn't ever happen. Well, what, uh, were you wearing a body worn camera at that time? I was wearing a, yeah, well, yes, but the, we attached them to our helmets. Yes. Uh, and at the time he came into the front door, you had a conversation with him? Yes. So if you had a chance to review that part of your, the footage of your body cam where he came into the front door. Yes, ma'am. And it's, is it fairly and accurately depicting uh, what you said to him, what he said to you in that exchange? Yes. And, and that would be Commonwealth's Exhibit 141. Play that footage at this time. Any objection? No, Judge. All right, then we'll be so admitted. Secure. She's 1080. We're leaving a couple people in here to hold the scene. Uh, it's secure for detectives to come up. So I think Casey, you're all Casey. You're all Casey. Is that Detective Hankison uh, we just saw in the door? Yes, ma'am. <coughs> you know, right there. That's theirs. So it's ours, it looks like. Can you stop it? Stop. And he just asked you, is that theirs? Or was that you? That yeah, I think you, I believe he was referring to the casings, the bullet casings that were on the ground. And he was asking, I guess, if um, those were the suspect's casings or was it the police officer's casings? And um, this is a crime scene at this point. Yes, ma'am. And you all are in charge of it, SWAT. At this point, yes. And he's entering into the crime scene. Yeah, he's in the crime scene. Okay, go ahead, please. So I'll just there down. Yeah, right there. That's theirs? I mean, it's ours, it looks like. There is in there. But I'd, I'd back out until they get PID in here. Okay, stop. So. And so is that you just said to him, back out until public integrity gets here? Yes, ma'am. You would you instructed Hankison to back out of the crime scene? Yes, I just asked him to leave. Okay. until the public integrity unit gets here because they would be the one taking over the investigation because right now it's you all SWAT is in charge of the crime scene correct until we're relieved by the detectives okay, go ahead. Isn't it very uh, we cannot see anything. Stop. what was that question he asked yes if uh, we saw any guns that were visible and what what did you advise? I advised them that I didn't see any. Um, I believe it was because I, I might have said because uh, I wasn't looking for guns or something like that. And then. Well, let's hear what this body cam says. Go ahead. Oh, that is it. Okay, so you advised you hadn't seen any. Right. Guns. But he asked, any guns visible? Correct. Now, did he go any further after you? After you ask him to leave, did he then leave? He did. Can we, since that went so fast, can we run through that one more time? Since we're holding the massive I hear you. I hear 
crazy, dude. It's crazy. <laughs> I was gonna say, hey man. Hey, uh, Sarge, watch your footing. There's some shell casings up here. Seeing secure. She's 1080. We're leaving a couple people in here to hold the scene. Uh, it's secure for detectives to come up. So I think it's casing here. Sorry. You're all casings. You're casing. So I'll just say that. Yeah. You have right there. That's theirs. Oh, it's ours, it looks like. There's some there. So I'd, I'd back out until they get PIU in here. So. That's not very nice to do again. Ah, we can see. Uh, at the very end, was that question he asked like a long gun? Uh, could you play it again? I, I couldn't really pick it up. Not very nice to do again. Ah, we can see. That seems to be like a long gun is what I heard. Right. Uh, that's all the questions I have. And we admitted uh, Exhibit 141. Mr. Matthews. Thank you, Your Honor. Sergeant Hogan, when you first rolled up in the Bearcat, you and your fellow SWAT officers, first of all, can you tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury what SWAT stands for? We've all heard that term, but what does it stand for? Yes, our uh, special weapons and tactics. And, and that requires special training for the members of the SWAT team, correct? It does. Lots of training. Yes, it does. Okay. When you all first rolled up there on Springfield in the Bearcat, um, what was the situation as far as were there other uniformed officers around? There were numerous uniformed officers. Um, it, probably in excess of 10 to 15 police marked police cars and there were other unmarked police cars there um, and by the time we got there there had to be at least 20 plus officers there how would you describe the scene or the situation it was pretty tense pretty chaotic at first and did you see any officers with shotguns or long guns I didn't see any shotguns but I did see um, rifles or patrol rifles which are AR-15 style rifles and where were they they were all um, in the parking lot behind uh, other people's cars that were parked in parking spaces. Trained, they were focused on the open door of where, you know, the front door of the apartment. And do you know how they came to be there like that? I do not. Okay. Do you know what the uh, LMPD policy is or procedure is for, for long gun use or deployment? It has to be, um, I'm not 100% sure on it. But I know it has to be uh, a major situation where immediate threat and a lot of um, danger not that a, a pistol wouldn't take care of. Would perimeter containment in barricaded sub suspect situations with a known weapon potential yes. be one of those situations? Yes, I've been on many barricaded subject or subject callouts where officers have shotguns and rifles. That's 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 the norm. Okay. Um, and you indicated, I believe, that when you went in the apartment, or when you went up to the apartment, it was dark, correct? It was. When you entered the apartment, did you, was there, were there any lights on? I did not see any. Did you see a TV on? There was a TV in the back. I know there, her TV, or the, um, I guess the master bedroom, that that TV was on. And could, was there any sound coming from it? I don't remember hearing any at the initial entry, but when I did enter the room at the very end, uh, it was on, yes, and I could hear it. It was pretty loud. Did you see any mirrors in the hanging on the walls in the apartment? Do you recall? I don't recall any, any mirrors. Okay. Now, you testified that Officer Hankison, or Detective Hankison, came up to the front door as we saw in the video, correct? Yes, yes sir. And he took a step into the apartment? Yes, sir. And he asked if there were any guns found? And as we just heard, if he asked if there were any long guns found, correct? Yes, sir. Um, you testified that it's not unusual for an officer involved in a situation to come up and, and look at closer to the scene, correct? On um, high-risk warrants where, we, where the SWAT team would serve them, it's not uncommon for the detectives of the investigating unit to come up when we turn the scene over to them or you know they take over control of the scene it's not uncommon for them to come up and say hey 
is the scene safe? Can we come and take it over? That's not com- that's 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 uh, very very common. With officer involved shootings, like I said, I've only been in one other one, and it it didn't happen there. But it's not to say it doesn't happen. But it's usually not common on a shooting scene that people want to get involved inside the scene. Well, would you think it was common for, or would you think it was unusual if Brett Hankison thought that he saw a long gun and he was trying to come up to the apartment and confirm whether there was one there or not? I can't talk. I can't speak to what you know what he what he sees or what he would think. Okay, and when you asked Brett Hankison to leave the apartment, he complied with your request, correct? Yes, he did. Nothing further. Thank you. Anything else of this witness? Sergeant, when uh, you testify, when you all arrived, um, Walker, as you approached up there, he was already in a, in a car, in a vehicle. That's what I never saw him in a vehicle or car, but Lieutenant Hoover advised that he was already in a vehicle. Yes. So when you, a SWAT approach was the, all the patrol that had been called in, they had rifles, right? Yes. They all, that's protocol. Not every single one of them, but there were multiple rifles out there. So how did you all approach the building if patrol was still sitting there with the rifles pointing at the building? So before we actually approached the building, um, our lieutenant told them to check up, which means basically pull your rifles up so that when we walk past them that they have a, a gun to the back of our head or back to our bodies. Basically, there's a crossfire issue, and we didn't want there to be one. So he told them to check up. So at that point in time, they pulled back and got out of the way, or at least pulled their gun out of the way so where we could cross. Right. And the detectives you were waiting to, for to come and take over the crime scene were the public integrity unit detectives. Yes. Right, not CID detectives. No. Right. Thank you. Anything else, Mr. Matthews? Okay. You can step down, thank okay. you. Your next witness. The Commonwealth calls Aaron Sarpe. Do you know how to spell that last name? S A R P E E. Thank you. All right, if you'd raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. You can take your mask off while you're um, testifying, if you wish, and please keep your voice up so the jurors can hear you. Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, tell, state your name for the jury. Uh, my name is Aaron Sapi. And you live here in Louisville? Yes, ma'am. And. Uh, where do you work, sir? Uh, I'm on a uh, disabled vet, Iraqi veteran, and I'm, I'm a truck driver. Thank you for your service. Thank you, ma'am. So, and you're a truck driver? Yes, ma'am. And um, in March <clears throat> of 2020, was that your occupation then also? Yes, ma'am. And you have a daughter? That yeah. And I thought she was two years old. At that time, in March of 2020, she was two years old. Yes, ma'am. And who was her babysitter? Uh, it's an older lady called Kapo. And does she live at 3003 Springfield Drive? Yes, ma'am, with her son. Her son lives there? Yes, also, ma'am. She lives with her son? Yes, ma'am. And she's your daughter's babysitter? Yes, ma'am. And... Uh, is he, are, are you related in any way, family related? No, ma'am. Friends. Just, just friends. Okay. 
And how long had you been taking her there uh, to the babysitter as of March of 2020? From, uh, from the time she was a baby. From the time she was a little baby. Yeah. So what hours did you work? From for? 2 to 12. 2, 2 p.m. to 12 midnight? Yes, ma'am. And so about what time did you normally get to the apartment to pick up your daughter? Sometimes I get a different, different time. But during that, during that night, I don't... You should, I, I don't usually recall what time I get there. Sometime but, after midnight. Yeah, probably what, like or 12, 20. Some, okay. Yeah. And which apartment in the building, as you're facing the building, uh, is the babysitter and her son? Which, where is their apartment? Uh, it was uh, on top of uh, Brianna Tedder. Did you know who Brianna Taylor was at that time? No, ma'am. You did not. Did you know who lived in that apartment? No, ma'am. And so your babysitter's apartment is directly above that apartment? Yes, ma'am. You later found out was, was Brianna, Brianna Taylor. Taylor. Yes, ma'am. So you got there that night to pick up your daughter? Yes, ma'am. And when you got there, did was there anybody outside? The building? Did you in the parking lot or anything? No, ma'am. And where did you park your vehicle? I parked my vehicle right in the middle of the parking lot because you should get out, run in there, and grab out and get back in the vehicle. Right. So you pulled up behind the cars that had that pulled parking, into the parking, parking spaces. Spot. Yes, ma'am. So it would be like, like here's. Like my fingers are the cars pulled into the lot. Yeah, right behind the car. Spaces that you pulled in this way. Yes, ma'am. What kind of vehicle were, did, uh, did you drive? Oh, uh, during that time I was driving a Toyota Sequoia, a white one. A white Sequoia. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, now, if we could, have, okay, we have now have a picture put up on the screen, mm -hmm. which is Commonwealth Exhibit Three. And can, uh, there's a laser pointer up there. Could you point out where your sequoia is in the picture? Yeah, right oh. there. Okay. There. And then where's the apartment of the babysitter? If you want to uh, well, point make, where the stairs are. Well, I'm making me stay. Okay, so right it's there. right up there. Yep. Okay. And. Um, there is anyone, did anyone else live there with the babysitter and her son? Were there anybody else that lived there? Uh, his daughter. His daughter also, and how old was she? I don't know. Okay. So you parked there, and what did you do then? Well, I parked, I parked right there. I got out and I walked into an apartment complex to pick up my daughter. And usually I spend a f about five minutes, ten minutes in the apartment, and I would get out and we would leave. Doing that, next, uh, I went upstairs. Uh, I pick up my daughter, coming out. It was a loud banking noise. When I came out, there was people downstairs, yeah, and uh, a gentleman uh, identified himself as a police, and he told me to go back in the apartment. And. What, so you saw, how many people did you see down at the bottom uh, of the steps? I, I, don't, I don't recognize them. I don't, more I don't. than, more than a couple, more than two? Yeah. Okay. And so one of them told you to go back in. Yeah. Uh, and did, you said they said they were police? Yeah, they identified themselves as cops. As cops. And so, did you say something back to them? No, ma'am. You didn't say anything? No, ma'am. And, you, uh, okay, how many times did they have to tell you, or did they tell you to go back in the apartment? Uh, one time. Just once? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, and so, you went back in? Yes, ma'am. Now, let, let me ask you, before you came out the door, mm -hmm. 
you said you had gone in, you were in there for, when you went in, when you climbed the steps and went in, mm -hmm. there was no one no, out there. there was nobody. Nobody. And you said you were in there about 10 minutes getting your daughter ready to? To leave. To leave. Yes, ma'am. And while you were in there getting your daughter ready and so forth, did you hear any knocking, banging, noises? I hear a, 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 a banging. I you heard a, banging? Yeah. And did you hear talking? No, ma'am. Like uh, people saying police or no, cops? Ma no, ma'am. Cops? No, ma'am. Okay. Um, you just heard banging? Yes, ma'am. Like knocking? Uh, it was loud. Hard knocking or? It was, I was inside. It was loud. Yeah. It was loud and you yeah. were inside? Yeah. And But you, you say you didn't hear anybody saying this is cops, open cop, it's the... No, ma'am. No. Yeah. Uh, well, do you remember talking to one of the detectives back in 2020 after this, all this happened? Uh, do you remember I, detective calling you on the phone and asking you about this? Yeah, that uh, was I think way back. It, I'm sorry, what? Do, I think two years ago. Yes. So, do you think your memory of what the details would have maybe been better back two years ago? No, ma'am. No. Okay. Do you remember talking to detective? Uh, a female detective, Seely, on the phone, uh, May of 2020, about what happened. I remember you, talking to somebody. I don't know. You do remember talking on the yeah. phone. Uh, do you remember saying to the detective that you did hear them saying when you heard the banging, "This is the cops," no, no, while I, you were inside? No, I know. Uh, I know. I don't remember. You don't remember? Yes, ma'am. Okay, um, Commonwealth moves to play the recording. That portion, segment of the recording um, with the question, did you hear any, uh, did you hear them say police or this is the cops before you open the door? No objection at all, Judge. That's fine. <clears throat> Your voice on that telephone. Yeah, but, yeah, but I know I, I remember telling that. That, 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 that was your voice talking to the detective. Yes, yes. And so, and you said, would she ask you what were they saying when they were knocking? And you said this, told her this is they were saying this is the cops. Yeah, I remember. I remember you don't remember that. that. Yeah. Okay. Um, but, but you do remember talking to the detective on the phone. I remember talking to somebody on the phone. Okay. Um, now, uh, let me ask you also, do you remember talking to another detective here in Louisville in August of 2020? No. Over at the, over in an office on Whittington Parkway. Do you remember coming in there and talking yeah, to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. you remember that? Yeah. And do you remember, um, it was Detective Herman Hall asking you uh, the same question. Mm -hmm. Did you hear, when you heard the banging while you were inside the apartment, mm -hmm. did you hear any talking? Did you hear them saying anything? Mm -hmm. And do you remember telling Detective Hall you heard them say, uh, while the knocking, this is the police? Do you remember? Uh, 
you play the auto, can you play that recording too? I don't have that recording, but I, um, I don't have that. If the, um, that record. That recording, unfortunately, is not very audible. Um, I do have Dete Detective Hall is present and would be able to say that you told him while the, you heard the knocking and banging, they were saying, this is the police. I think, uh, I think it will be, if you get this recording, so I think it will be another recording for you to identify that I said that, you know. Okay, well, it. Judge, for the record, I will stipulate that he made those statements on that recording that Ms. Whaley is referring to. All right. We'll just um, take that stipulation that both attorneys have listened to that recording mm -hmm. and that you did um, make that statement to Detective Hall that uh, the police said that they were the police as they were knocking. So I'll have the jury um, accept that as testimony here in the case. Thank you. Now, um, once you went back in after you said they only asked you one time mm -hmm. to go back in and you went back in, mm -hmm. then what happened after you went back in? Now, when I went back in the five seconds, I heard machine gun go off. Okay, you heard gunfire? Mm hmm Uh, and what? How long did that last? Uh, five seconds. Six. Five, six seconds? Mm -hmm. And that's it? That was the end? Yep. Then what did you do? Uh, I stayed in the apartment complex. Uh, so after the gunfire, you did not open the door back up? or. I don't remember. Um, Did you, how long did you stay in there? Uh, I was there probably till three, four in the morning before I leave. And so did, did the, uh, did you learn what had happened? Did you, at some point, uh, later on down the road? Now, what happened, when did you ultimately leave your apartment and go what I leave what my when did apartment? you um, leave the apartment of the babysitter when do you remember when you actually ended up leaving no I don't remember okay. was it the next day during no. it, it was the same day in the morning right this that same morning was it like up in the late morning or afternoon no late morning late morning and you took your daughter with you Mm -hmm. How did you, what happened to the Sequoia? Did you? I left it there. And why is it you left it there? Because uh, I was about to leave and um, one of the officers said it had to be on an investigation, so I left it there. The officer asked you to leave it there yeah. because it was part of the investigation? Yeah. And so how did you, what kind of transportation did you? Uh, I called uh, my sister. She came to pick me up. She came and picked you up? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> now, did you, uh, did you know that a bullet came through the babysitter's apartment? How, yeah, how it, did you find that out? Uh, from the son's uh, standing. That's your babysitter's son? Yeah, babysitter's son. Where did it go? Where'd that bullet go? Uh, I say it came through the closet. The closet, and then what? It went somewhere. It went up through yeah. the roof? I don't know. Through? Okay. What did he say about it? I don't know. Okay. It came through the floor of the closet, I assume? Ma'am. I never went in detail with him, 
where the bullet came from, but he just told me the bullet went through the closet. That's why the, uh, okay. the FBI told him. Uh, I never asked him where the bullet went. Okay. And when did you find that out? Was it that morning or later? Uh, the, like two days later when he was moving from all of the apartment. I see. Two days later is when you found out. Yeah. All right. So, once you went back in, after they told you, you were out actually on the landing when you were getting ready to leave and yes. saw them, police. Yeah. And they told you to go back in, and once you did that, it wasn't very long yeah. till you heard the gunfire. Yes, ma'am. And you said the gunfire, you think, was maybe five, six seconds. Yes, ma'am. All right, thank you. No further questions. Moved to that. Objection. I'm sorry, what did I'm sorry, that was the previous. This would be 142 of the uh, phone clip. The phone clip, all right. All right, cross examination. Thank you, Your Honor. Is the pronunciation of your last name Sarpe? Sir, you're, you said you're a veteran, correct? Yeah, I'm a Iraqi veteran. Did you serve in Iraq? Did I understand? Yes. When you were in Iraq, were you in combat? Yes. Okay, you testified here before that when you heard the gunshots go off, it sounded like a machine gun, correct? Yeah. And it only lasted five or six seconds? Yeah. And did you hear any voices or any talking while that was happening? No. Did you look out of the apartment after it happened? No didn't come out, I think you said, till 3 or 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning, correct? Yeah, I think 3, yeah, 4. I think. And when you left, you did not leave in your Sequoia, correct? No. When did you come back and get your Sequoia? Uh, it was the, uh, the next day, the okay. following day. The following day? Yeah. When you came back to get your car, did you find anything, any shell casings? Yeah, I found one. You know what kind it was? Uh, it was uh, it's, it's almost like uh, the M16 round. Like an M16 round? That's yeah. a rifle round. Rifle round. Yeah. What did you do with that case? I gave it to one of the uh, to uh, I turned it into the uh, the AG office. You remember when you did that? When I went for the interview. When you went for the interview? Yep. Okay. Thank you. I have nothing for you. Any redirect? Uh, nothing. All right. You can step down. Thank you. Thank you. All right, your next witness. Sergeant Mike Burns. Take a seat, please. And if you raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. State your name, please. Michael Burns. And where are you employed? Uh, LMPD. In what position? Uh, Full-time SWAT team. How long have you been with the department? Uh, going on 12 years, I believe. And how long in SWAT? Uh, just over six. In that, uh, were you in that capacity on March 12, 2020? Yes, ma'am. And were you involved in the serving of search warrants on March 12th at the 
Elliott Avenue addresses. Yes, ma'am. Were there two SWAT teams on Elliott that night? Uh, I wouldn't necessarily consider two SWAT teams, but most of the entire team was there, yes. We, we have a team one and a team two, and I think most of the entire team was on Elliott, yes. Okay, you have a team one and a team two. Correct. Is that two teams? It's two teams inside of one team, but basically to help our on-call schedule. So you're on call half the month versus... Okay, so how many SWAT total are there? I believe there's 30-something total officers on the SWAT team. Okay, and how many were involved on Elliott that night? Probably 25 or 28-ish. Very Somewhere large number, almost the entire SWAT. Correct. Um, <clears throat> at some point that evening on the 12th, did you hear there was a problem on Springfield Drive? Yes, ma'am. And um, at that point, what did you do? Uh, I heard some communication come over the our radio, uh, which um, sounded like that someone had been shot address and that they needed a medic and possibly SWAT's armor to the location. And so did you go to Springfield? I did, yes ma'am. And who, uh, how many SWAT officers went to Springfield, if you know? I believe there's six or seven of us plus our uh, medic. And you all went in the one vehicle? We went in one of our armored vehicles, which we call the Bearcat. The Bearcat. Um, once you got on scene, uh, what did you do? Once we pulled up in the Bearcat, um, all the officers and detectives that were in the parking lot uh, were holding, pulling security with their weapons on the apartment. Um, we pull up, we exit the Bearcat, we try to get as much intel as we're driving there and once on scene. Uh, we just come up with a, a quick plan from the SWAT side, and which was to, I had a robot, which is a, it's a, it's a throw bot. You can throw it into houses and uh, clear space without having to put yourself in there. So that the plan was to, which I had, uh, the robot, the plan was to go up to the door, throw it in, and then try to clear it as best as possible because we were still under the impression that there was possibly a shooter uh, inside the apartment. Now, you said when you arrived, patrol was still out uh, around the front of the building, patrol officers? Yes, ma'am. With their rifles pointed at I the building? I believe some had rifles, some had their uh, pistols. So how was that taken care of? Uh, our lieutenant got on the, well, I don't believe it was the radio. I think just out loud told everyone to, uh, check down, which basically means stop pointing your weapons at the apartment as we, as in SWAT, are about to approach it. Because that, with them still holding their guns at the building, that would put SWAT in danger, walking in front of those guns to enter the, the apartment building. That is correct. Which would be the safe thing to do then, right? Correct. Now, as you approached the building, did you see the sliding glass doors? Yes, ma'am. That was the sliding glass doors, which is right next to the sidewalk to the breezeway, is basically the first thing you see of the apartment from the direction that we came from. And did you notice, uh, could you see through those sliding glass doors into the apartment? Uh, from what I recall, there was blinds or drapes or something along those lines covering the sliding glass door. I don't know if they were open or closed, but you could definitely see that there was um, blinds or, like I said, drapes covering that up. And did you notice the shattered glass in the door as you approached? Yes, ma'am. Did you, um, <clears throat> what did you do then? Who was the lead into the apartment? Uh, Probably Sergeant Joe Cassie, maybe he kind of took the lead on that. My, myself and Sergeant Hogan were there as well, but um, Sergeant Cassie seemed to take the lead on the entry to the apartment. I was, like I said, I had the robot, and then Sergeant Hogan was in the 
and the group of SWAT officers as well. And did you take a, did you actually, you threw the robot in initially? I did, yes ma'am. And then what happened? Uh, once I deployed our robot into the open door of the apartment, um, I ran back to the Bearcat to give the controller uh, to Officer Walker who was driving the Bearcat. Um, the Bearcat was basically out of play unless for hard cover, so I gave him a job to do. By the time I made it back up to the breezeway, uh, Sergeant Cassie, I think they had already reached the uh, threshold of the apartment door and he had noticed that there was someone down in the hallway. That's when he made the call and decision to go ahead and take it, meaning make entry into the, to the apartment, uh, clear it, and then reach up to the person that's down in the hallway. So instead of using the robot, because you could have used the robot to go room to room remotely and clear, but because Sergeant Cassie saw someone down at the end of the hallway, decision was made to personally enter. Yes, ma'am. Okay, and so did you go in then? I did. I believe I might have been one of the last ones into the apartment. Okay, and did you have a particular room that you were responsible to clear or is it just uh, the room that I ended up doing clearing with Sergeant Hogan I believe was the back bedroom uh, possibly her bedroom and then the bathroom that was attached to the bedroom and when you say clear what exactly are you doing we're looking for humans or threats that could possibly still be inside the apartment and did you find any threats no ma'am and Sergeant Cassie found a gun. I, I believe there was one, yes. But did I, you? I never saw him on a, with my eyes. That was probably in a different room that, that he had entered and cleared, but the room. You were in the back bedroom. Correct, yes, the last, uh, the last bedroom in the hallway on the right. And were there any guns in there? Not that I saw, but like I said, we, there was nothing in plain view, but we don't search houses when we clear them we just search for uh, where a human being could possibly be hiding at a human being with a some sort of weapon of threat uh, just a human in general as it's far as when the SWAT team does execute search warrants okay. and nothing was no one no person was located other than as you later knew Breonna Taylor at the end of the hallway. That's correct. Later found. Correct. Now, at some point, did you, uh, during this time, were wearing on your helmet a camera? Yes, ma'am. And that records everything you were doing? Yes, ma'am. Or a video, uh, audio also recorded. Did you encounter, uh, the defendant at the front door while you were in the apartment? Yes, ma'am, as I was about to exit the apartment. And did you know who he was at that time? Yes, ma'am. And how is that that you knew? Uh, just through some uh, search warrants that SWAT has done for uh, narcotics in the past. Did you know that he had been involved in the shooting that had just occurred? I don't think I did at that point, no, ma'am. Um, and during the time that, so you were there in the front door, what did he do? He had walked up from the breezeway, kind of towards the apartment door, and then just asked a question if there was anyone possibly dead down in, in something along the lines of, is, is there someone dead inside or down inside? And what did, what did you say or what did you do? If I remember right, I, I think I had told him yes because I think at that point our medic had already said um, that she had passed. And uh, have you had a chance to review the body camera footage with, of that exchange with him? I have multiple times in the past, yes. And it's an accurate depiction of the exchange that occurred there with the defendant? Yes, ma'am. At this time we would ask to admit that uh, footage objection. Would you be exhibit uh, 143? 143? 143. All right, it'll be so admitted.
and also slug and paste it in there. Cell phone here. Huh? Cell phone here. I don't have the slug there. there. Paste it here. What is it? What's this address? Is anybody here dead? Oh, yes. Yeah. Wow. You want to stop. Now, if uh, can you see, you can see on the screen. Uh, yes, ma'am, I see And is that person that just walked up, the defendant, who you can see is, let's go back and start again, if you would. Oh, yes. Wow, we're waiting. Tell me, call me. What's the address here? Hey, 3003 Springfield, apartment 3. Hey, two. Yo, is this a Oh, oh, yeah. 3003 Springfield Park 4. Hey, there's. Okay. Now, yes. is that the defendant approaching? Yes, ma'am. Sorry, I, the glare was bad on the big screen. Okay, go ahead. What's this address? Is anybody here dead? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. well, I'm waiting. Stop. Tim's calling. So, was that him that asked, is anybody here dead? Yes, ma'am. Okay, go ahead. What's the address here? Hey, 3003 Springfield, apartment 3. Hey, or 2. Yo, apartment 3. Oh, yeah. 3,000. Three thousand three Springfield Apartment Four. Hey, there's and did you respond? Because I couldn't hear. When he asked, is anybody in here dead? I had said yes. You said yes. You, and you heard that. Correct. Okay. That's all. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, just a couple. <clears throat> Sergeant Burns, uh, this is just my own curiosity, but I'm curious about this throwbot. What is that exactly? It's just a remote control robot with a camera on it that we deploy a lot of times in houses to clear them as best as we can. Obviously, it's a lot safer for us. Well, is uh, it like a ball? Uh, no, it's a, like it's got two wheels on it and a, a lever on it that keeps it on its upright, and it just. You just drive it around like a remote control car. Okay, you don't actually physically throw it, is that? No, I, I threw it, yes. Okay. You can throw them. And it's equipped with a camera? Yes, sir. But you never used that this night, correct? No, sir. Okay. Um, and then when Fred Hankison, or well, first of all, did you, you actually made entry into the apartment, correct? That is correct, sir. And you went back into what, the back bedroom? Yes. Was the TV on in there? I believe it was on, yes. Was the sound turned up, do you know? That I don't, re I don't remember. The TV was on? Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, and Fred Hankison came up to the door and asked, is anybody dead in here, correct? Yes, sir. Was Sergeant Hogan there at that time? Uh, uh, yes, sir. I heard his voice in the background. And do you remember him telling Detective Hankison to leave the apartment? I do remember him making a statement in regards to this is a crime scene, you know, like no one is to enter or something along those lines. Did Detective Hankison then leave? To uh, the I best of your so knowledge? On the body cam, it looked like he had turned around and left, yes. Thank you. Anything else of this witness? Uh, you indicated that as soon as you walked up, you saw the shattered glass at the sliding door and you could not see through into the apartment um, did you know that those were shots coming from which direction I had no idea if they came from inside or outside once you were in the apartment did you see the shattered glass on the carpet inside I believe I remember seeing some but I did not enter the living room right because you uh, were in the I back bedroom in. correct okay thank you Anything further? No. You can step down. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we've been going for close to two hours. Let's go ahead and take a break. 
It's 25 after 3. Let's break until uh, quarter till 4. Remember the separation admonition, please. Thank you.